What's up, everybody? Welcome to a History Things podcast video exclusive. I'm your host, Pat McGuire. Joining me today is my co-host, as always, Matt Borders. Uh, we are doing something a little bit different today. We are getting out of the War Department studios, uh, away from the microphones, and out into the field. Uh, we are up against the main road today, so I do apologize if you do hear uh, some of the engines of Frederick, Maryland, because that's where Matt and I both live, and that's where we're broadcasting from. We're actually on the site of the Rocky Springs Schoolhouse, uh, which in 1864, 156 years ago today, Day, because it's July 8th, 2020, as we're filming this, this was the site of a very sharp cavalry skirmish that preceded the overall Battle of Monocacy Junction, the battle that saved Washington, July 9th, 1864. So, Matt, this battle's pretty interesting. It's short, it's sharp, and it features a bunch of Marylanders. Uh, go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about what exactly it is that happens here uh, in 1864. It sure does feature some Marylanders, Pat. We've got Bradley Johnson commanding a brigade of cavalry out here and aiding him with the 1st and 2nd Maryland Confederate Cavalry will be uh, Harry Gilmore. Harry Gilmore, right? Yep. So we got Bradley Johnson's a Frederick guy, and Gilmore's from around the Baltimore area. Right? That's right. Like a little bit north of Baltimore. And these two men are going to be sent on the Johnson-Gilmore raid tomorrow, but they're not here for that yet. In fact, Bradley Johnson had wanted to break into his old hometown of Frederick, Maryland yesterday on, on July 7th but federal forces in this area, specifically the 8th Illinois Cavalry and half of Alexander's Battery of Baltimore Artillery are gonna keep his Cavaliers at a distance and also the Confederate command, specifically General Ransom, is not going to allow Johnson to make that attempt. Remember, Frederick knows what's going on at this point. They know about the action that's happening in Middletown. They know these forces have crossed into Maryland. And as of July 7th, they know they're very close because there has been an exchange right up relatively close to us here on Braddock Heights right. and things like that. So now we're here a day later, we know what's happening. Right. Now Johnson, for those of you familiar with Frederick County, he's actually at Hagen's, Hagen's Tavern, right up there near Braddock Heights. Right. Now, that's going to be his headquarters for the 7th and the 8th. His troopers are spread out all along the Catoctin Mountain and coming right up this road here. And which one is this, Pat? So we're on Rocky Springs, and we're staring right at the intersection of Rocky Springs and Kemp Lane. Right that way. They're coming right up Rocky Springs Road towards the Rocky Springs Schoolhouse, and they're gonna run right into Harry Gilmore's Confederate Cavalry. And there's gonna be about 100 federal troopers in this immediate area. Most of Company M and a good chunk of Company B uh, for the 8th Illinois. Those troopers are gonna be very surprised to run into this Confederate Cavalry, and Gilmore's men are gonna take chase almost immediately, driving them back towards what is today the Golden Mile uh, on Route 40 in Frederick, Maryland. So you guys got to remember, this is not a modern day paved road like you're hearing these massive trucks drive by in the background on, right? This is a, a hot summer hazy day in the mid-Atlantic in, in July. Right. It is a dusty road that cavalry is riding on. So there's a lot of uh, confusion about what you're looking at and these these elements of these cavalry forces are literally on top of each other before they realize what's happening so when the bullets start to fly they're about as close as the six feet of social distance <laughs> that matt and i are standing right now maybe not quite that close but pretty darn close. pretty darn close now what's interesting about this fight is is that gilmore's cavaliers his horse soldiers are so excited they're so rambunctious about getting after these federals they're going to chase them down and then very quickly lose their direction. They're going to be confused as to where they are and how to get back to Confederate lines. They're actually going to pull a civilian out of his home and, ask, and order him to be a guide for these Confederate cavalry. Help! We're lost! Help us find our way! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they will succeed in getting back to their lines, but it's going to be yet another delay for this Confederate cavalry out here. And in fact, by this point in time, the ransom of Middletown has already occurred and Confederate infantry, due to the fighting out here along the, the eastern face of the Catoctin Mountain, has begun to move this direction. Uh, Colonel Clendenin of the 8th Illinois, Alexander's uh, Baltimore Artillery, the 3rd Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, they are now falling back. They are going to fall back through Frederick, Maryland, heading 
to Monocacy Junction. So where in just sort of to place everybody, Matt, in the timeline of all this. So by now we know that, that this movement has been taking place. Grant Down in Virginia has already dispatched elements of the, is it the 6th Corps? It is. Uh, to come up and support. Where are those boys uh, right now? Because right now Lou Wallace is, like, if I'm incorrect, correct me if I'm wrong rather, is sitting on, as of this moment, July 8th, Right around two to 3,000 guys. About 3,300 by the time they all arrive, and they weren't all here at the beginning of the skirmishing on the 8th. In fact, there was only about 1,500 or so men uh, for much of the day on the 8th. But by the evening of July 8th, the rest of Wallace's command has shown up, and the lead elements of the 3rd Division, 6th Union Corps, are beginning to arrive because they actually arrived in Baltimore uh, around, or I should say, Ricketts himself, James Ricketts, the commander, 3rd Division, 6th Union Corps, will arrive in Baltimore around 7 a.m. today. And as his command comes in, they're going to be put on a special train provided by John Garrett, the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and sent out to Monocacy Junction. Interesting side note, they weren't supposed to stop there. Their orders were to go all the way to Harper's Ferry. So However, they're, they're expecting to intercept the big force of everything out that far. They're not expecting them to catch them here? Exactly, wow. yeah. They didn't realize that uh, Early had actually moved this far into central Maryland. They were trying to get to the Harper's Ferry garrison to support them. Now, Lou Wallace is going to stop that train at Monocacy Junction. He'll kind of inform Ricketts of what's going on. James Ricketts, he's a field commander. He's been in the mix before. He understands that the situation changes while you're in transit, and he's going to detrain his forces. And over the evening of July 8th and into the early morning hours of July 9th, we'll eventually have 6,600 total federal troops at the defense's in and around the area of Monocacy Junction. So by the time this this fight breaks down, um, it's safe to say that both sides of the coming engagement know that it's about to happen. Yes. Uh, Lou Wallace knows he's got a, a, a superior in the in the numbers sense force in front of him. Um, he's got to have pretty good intelligence by now that, that early has been moving. And I know that the, the numbers vary between 15 and 18,000. So we're just going to err on the side of caution. We're going to say that early has around 15,000 guys moving with them. And, and if you compare that roughly to what's going to become the 6,600, right. like this is a strong numbers disadvantage for the federal forces. And they probably know that. And likewise, on the other side here, uh, Jubal Early is aware that he's got a smaller number of guys in front of him. And uh, correct me again if I'm wrong, he's also aware that the, I guess the situation is that it should be mostly 100 days men correct. defending Monocacy Junction. Yep, he is not aware that Union veterans have arrived as of yet. He's going to get a fairly rude awakening or some of his men are going to get a fairly rude awakening by that during the fighting at Monocacy tomorrow. But he is under the impression that it is 100 days troops and militia that are in front of him. He doesn't believe they're going to be able to hold. He's looking to hit them and move on on July 9th. So he has no plans to really stay in Frederick. His plan is just to roll over this small defense and make his run on Washington. Because remember, at this point, we're in the sort of you know, interpret it how you want part of the orders that Lee gave him. The initial orders were just to sort of clear out the valley. And if you get to the bottom of the valley, because remember that whole Shenandoah thing, <laughs> up is down and down is up. North but, and south at least. Yeah, right. So, but you know, <laughs> early gets to the bottom of the valley. And I, I believe Lee sort of gives him the option of if you think you can do it, do it. You know, and if not, come back because we're getting pounded down here on the peninsula. But um, so so Early's expecting to really not have a fight here. Right. Uh, he's expecting to roll, expecting to keep moving. Right. And um, and I hope you guys join Matt and I tomorrow because uh, this is a good place to leave you because we're talking about mostly July 8th here at the Rocky Springs uh, Schoolhouse. But Matt and I are going to be back out in the field tomorrow, July 9th, uh, covering the anniversary, I believe it's what, 156? 156. 156 of the Battle of Monocacy Junction. So join us, uh, you know, as soon as Matt and I get off our day jobs, we'll be out there doing the thing. <laughs> but uh, so, so look for us in the evening. But uh, we thank you guys for joining us. And uh, we'll leave you with this really cool piece uh, of, of historic preservation and progress. Not to ever soapbox, but this is why it's really important. Um, I live probably about a half a mile from here. Matt's probably within four miles of here. So we are, like I said, in, literally in our backyards. And this building is known to a lot of Civil War geeks, but not to a lot of other people because it's kind of just been in a derelict condition for the last few years. Of late, 
It's been under a uh, restoration process, and as yep. you can see right now, they've got some really cool rubber mats and things set up to sort of protect the, the masonry from the water getting in. So um, I believe you can follow, I don't know the exact page, but if you just sort of Google uh, or use your Facebook or social media search tools for Rocky Springs Restoration, Rocky Springs Schoolhouse Restoration. They've got a nice website. Yeah, you can absolutely follow along with the progress they're making here, which is really neat. And, and from time to time, Matt and I will probably update you on that just because we like to geek out about our hometown, Frederick. So uh, for everybody here at the History Things Podcast, which as of now is just me and my buddy, uh, I'm Pat, this is Matt, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good night. Bye.